everybody. Thank you to the State Library and to Kate and Anne for inviting the museum to be involved in the Family History Feast today. The museum's also about storytelling, so we're really pleased to be involved. So as Anne said, today my presentation is about immigration occupations and I'll be sharing some stories from the Immigration Museum. So I work in the Discovery Centre of Melbourne's Immigration Museum, where visitors are invited to conduct research into their family's migration story. All non-Indigenous Australians have a migration story in their family history. Immigration is about us all, those who were here and those who came. Settling into a new country is not easy. Immigrants have to adapt to an unfamiliar environment and lifestyle while ma maintaining aspects of their previous culture and way of life. Many newcomers spent their lives in limbo, spending months in temporary migrant accommodation committed to two-year labour contracts. For others, settlement has been far easier because they spoke English or government have off offered assisted land or home scheme. Generations of immigrants have had to adapt to a new climate, new landscape, new language, new currency and new lifestyle and often new occupations. Each immigrant has their own unique story to tell. Whilst for many it was difficult, the vast majority eventually found their feet. The Immigration Museum explores why they came, where they settled, and how they started a new life in Victoria. Today I'll share some of those stories that are featured in the Immigra Immigrant Stories exhibition at the museum. These stories highlight how one's occupation is instrumental in forming their identity, particularly in a new country. So the first story that I'll share with you is called Behind the Wheel, and it's about Yusef Romanos and Tansa Eid. Yusef Romanos and Tansa Eid were born in 1938, 1949, 44, and 1947 respectively in Hadjit, a small Maronite Catholic village situated in the mountains on a pre precipice above the Quadisha Valley in the north of Lebanon. As sons of apple orchidists, they learned to cultivate gardens and tend to ag agricultural land from an early age. After leaving his studies at the age of 16, Youssef worked as a stonemason and was earning a good living. He built stone terraced walls on stepped garden beds, characteristic of the mountains of Lebanon. Youssef married his neighbour, Nadimi Hanna, in 1961, and they had three children, John, Jeanette and Raymond. Nadimi had three brothers and an uncle in Australia. In 1965, under the sponsorship of her brother, Elias Hanna, and guaranteed by her uncle, Raymond Betros, one of Hadjit's pioneers who migrated to Melbourne in 1926, they boarded the Greek ship Patrice and set out for Australia. They stayed with her brother Nadim and his family in Strathmore for a few months before buying a house in Essendon with the help of her brother Alias. They had four, their fourth child, Simon, in Australia. Yusuf spoke Arabic, a little French, but not even a smattering of English. And yet as soon, as, soon after his arrival, with the help of Nadimi's relatives, he prepared the paperwork to sponsor some of his siblings and relatives to Australia. The following year, Tansa arrived in the Archeo Laoro with his sister Sadie. He was the youngest of eight children, and after leaving school at age 17, he worked as a caretaker of an apple orchid. He wasn't too keen on a future working in the land and looked forward to opportunities awaiting him in Australia. He imagined Melbourne would be a sophisticated city and as such he had a number of suits and shirts tailored from fine English fabric. Upon his arrival, he discovered Australians were very casually dressed and soon adapted his attire. On a return visit to Lebanon in the late 1960s, he met Naza Sassini. He wrote her a note, placed it in a box of chewing gum and handed it to her. By the early 1970s, they were engaged. They married in 1974, and he brought her to Australia where they had four children, Christopher, Kevin, Christine, and John. Ramanos migrated in 1967 with his wife, Yvonne, their son, Tony, and his brother, Georges, his, wife, his brother, Georges's wife, Georgette, and their son, Raymond. He left school age 14, and he too worked on his family, family's apple orchard. As a romantic, gregarious, and charismatic young man, he had a talent for writing and reciting poetry. Whilst courting Yvonne, he remembers reading Romeo and Juliet to her while she was on her balcony hanging laundry. In response, she poured out a bucket of water over his head. <laughs> they were soon married in 1965. After having their son, Tony, they decided if the opportunity arose to come to Australia, they would take it. 
Romanos recalls that he wanted to make a better future for his family, musing that you can work hard in Lebanon and have no opportunities to make money, whereas in Australia, hard work pays off. They had four children in Australia, Antoinette, Claret, Joseph and Sam. The Eid brothers were a part of the second wave of Lebanese migration to Australia. From 1948 to 1975, which followed the first wave in the 1980s to 1920s, like so many of Australia's migrants, the Hadship Lebanese community in Victoria was establ established through chain migration and dates back to 1926. The first people of Lebanese descent came to Australia in the 19th century, when the region was classi now classified as Lebanon was part of the Ottoman Empire. There have been three main waves of Lebanese migration, the largest coming after the outbreak of civil war in 1975. The Lebanese population tripled between 1966 and 1976. In 2001, the census recorded 76,451 Lebanon-born people, up 2.1% from 2006. The majority, over 50,000, lived in New South Wales, with 15,000 in Victoria. The census recorded major religious, the major religious um, among Lebanese-born Australians as Islam, Catholic, and Eastern Orthodox. And we'll see what this year's census has to say about any changes that have happened in migration in the past five years. So Yusuf and his family first stayed with his brother-in-law in Strathmore. By the time his brothers arrived, Yusuf had bought a house in Essendon where they all lived until they could put deposits on their own homes. They worked at Footscray's Brad Mill Cotton Mills and Tanza studied English via correspondence. It was while working in the textile factory in the 1970s that the Eid brothers decided to establish a taxi business. The prospect of greater earnings and being your own boss outweighed the long hours and personal and financial risks. Greater earnings could be made driving taxis compared with working for set wages, provided they were willing to put in the long hours. The brothers were able to fulfill their hopes of prosperity, independence and mobility, and were able to pop home for lunch or a coffee, rituals that reinforced their sense of freedom. This is a great photo. Um, that's Tanza Eid from the 70s. Pretty cool character. In the early 1970s, Melbourne taxi drivers were required to hold an ordinary, taxi, ordinary driver's licence for three years and pass a location test before obtaining a taxi driver's certificate. After six months, drivers could purchase a taxi licence for about 17000 allowing them to own and operate a taxi business. Relatives advised the brothers that while factory work paid $50 a week, they might make, make up to $400 a week driving taxis. In 1973, they all bought taxi licences. Owning a licence proved to be a lucrative long-term investment. There's some of their um, driver's IDs from back in the 70s. Uh, Romanos was king of the airport. His pension for multiple hiring and attracting Skybus passengers to his taxi exemplified his entrepreneurial drive. His gregarious and jovial nature made him very popular with other drivers. Handling the good, the bad and the ugly in the back seat of the taxis became a way of life. Yusuf was firm with his passengers and he didn't suffer fools. Tanza was a stickler for rules, preferring to use psychology to get out of tricky situations in his taxi. Um, the museum's collected a number of items to display in the galleries to help tell the story of the Eids. Here you can see an old fare meter, which is a bit different to today's version, as well as patches from the brothers' uniforms. So these are on display in the museum. Yusuf Romanos and Tanza hung Christian icons in their taxis for protection. A postcard with an image of Mary and Jesus was always placed on the back of the sun visor in Tanza's taxi. During the 1980s, both Yusuf and Tanza proudly displayed medallions of Saint Chabel, a Lebanese saint, in their taxis. However, the depiction of his long, dark beard provoked passengers to constantly ask why they had a picture of Khomeini, the Iranian leader, in their taxis. This provoked negative connotations from their less tolerant passengers, so they soon removed the medallion and decided to only display Western Christian images. Um, there's a couple of quotes there that um, sort of talk about the kind of um, intolerance that they did get from passengers around that time as well, which is very disappointing. Um, taxi cabs have long been hired for wedding parties, theatre outings and balls. In the 1970s, the Eid brothers often chauffeured brides to their weddings. They wore grey suits with shirts, ties, chauffeur hats and gloves. Their taxis were black, immac immaculately cleaned and adorned with white ribbon. 
Uh, taxi Talk magazine was established as a monthly trade journal for the taxi industry. It provides a unique insight with the changing face of Victorian taxi industry from 1966 to present day. Its pages are filled with taxi news, advertisements and jokes. Yusuf Romanoff, Romanoff and Tans are often read Taxi Talk while waiting for a fare. These are on loan from the State Library, which is sort of highlights our partnership with them as well. So these are on display at the museum at the moment as well. The brothers often socialised with other taxi drivers at the Mooney Ponds rank. While waiting for their fare, they told jokes, shared stories and advice on being street smart. Tansa remembers in the early 1980s, one night a couple of troublemakers got into my taxi and immediately began insulting me. I knew I had to get rid of them fast. I put the car into drive and turned on the ignition. The car wouldn't start. I pretended to be frustrated and asked them to push start the car. Once they were out of the taxi, I quickly drove away. <laughs> Very savvy. <laughs> These days, um, the taxi industry has changed tenfold. With 75 combined years, of, combined years of driving taxis, the Ede brothers left the industry in the 1990s and 2000s, wary of the working conditions and fearful of the impact of deregulation. Being on the taxi once offered entrepreneurial opportunities for newly arrived migrants. In recent decades, the choices have been more limited. Since the mid-1990s, the taxi industry has shifted from an owner-operated service to an investor-driven industry. In the 90, early 1970s, the Ede brothers bought their licences for around $17,000. However, with the cost of licence rising to just under $480,000 in 2000, 2012, the owner taxi business is now out of reach for new migrants. Instead, they have to lease licences for around $24,000 a year. Taxi driving was, and still is, challenging, unpredictable and often precarious work. For Yusuf Romanos and Tansa, extended hours on the road, increased the risk of accidents and working in confined space had adverse effects on their health. Juggling passenger and pedestrian behaviour, traffic conditions and street navigation could be extremely stressful. Today, most taxi drivers work long hours in highly regulated industry with no working entitlements or investment opportunities. The rise in insecure the risks and insecurities remain the same without the silver lining. And also, this is an um, Indian taxi driver protest from 2008, you might remember. And things have changed a lot since we've had that story in the Immigration Museum with the introduction of Uber as well. So we'll see how things go from there. Uh, the next story that I'll share with you is about the Gung family, May, May and Sydney Louis Gung. Little Burke Street in 1980 was full of horse-drawn carts, furniture makers, laundries, fruit and vegetable businesses, incense, opium, and the clacking of mahjong tiles. Tong Yung Gay, as the Chinese residents called Little Burke Street and its adjoining lanes, continued to expand. It was here in a small lane off Little Burke Street that Yen Pain, known as May, was born. By 1900, this part of Chinatown was diverse, noisy, and crowded a place where Chinese and non-Chinese people interacted, gambled, did business, and shared gossip over tea in clan-owned general stores. May possibly played with children from different families and purchased nuts and sugar cane from street hawkers. May grew up in China and attended a Christian school, and it was there that she married Sydney Louis Gung, who had returned temporarily to China from Melbourne in 1912. Sydney was born around 1879 in Canton in southern China. He arrived in Australia in his early 20s and after four years work, working, was working in Melbourne, first in his own carpentry shop in Little Burke Street and later as a foreman and fruit department manager in the import and export business owned by his older brother, Harry Louis Payne. For Sydney, adjusting to the lo life in Victoria was not always easy. The Gung family recalls he was once attacked by local larrikins who cut off his queue, his braid, a common act of assault against Chinese men. May and Sydney had 10 children between 1914 and 1932, with the eldest Maisie and the youngest Christ Christine born in China. The family travelled fre frequently to their home country, jumping through bureaucratic hoops in order to leave and re-enter. During World War II, three of the children lived in Australia with their parents. The other children remained in China to complete their education. The family lived in homes in Newmarket, North Melbourne and Carlton. Sydney died in 1954 and May in 1969. In 1901, Chinese merchants erected a beautiful pagoda-inspired arch in the centre of Melbourne to celebrate Federation. 
Two days before the opening of Parliament, around 200,000 people were reported to have watched the Chinese dragon procession pass through the city streets. This is a cool photo from the museum collection of that. Um, yet Chinese immigration to Australia was severely restricted. Naturalisation impossible to obtain and Chinese Australians who left temporarily needed permission to return. The decades after the 1850s gold rushes had been punctured by discrimination, resentment, even violence. The Chinese population plummeted from about 26,000 in 1901 to 12,000 in 1947. Nevertheless, this vibrant community managed to settle, run businesses, raise family and establish associations. Ironically, the Immigration Restriction Act from 1901 generated vast numbers of government documents which now assist the tracing of Chinese Australians. The Gung family paper trail shows how they negotiated their residency in Australia and return trips to China. Sorry. Many Chinese families chose to be mobile in order to arrange a Chinese education for their children, set up businesses, and eventually retire in their home villages. Before any overseas journey, Sydney and his China-born children re were required to apply for certificates exempting them from the dictation test to re ensure their re-entry. Women who migrated from China in vastly smaller numbers than men are harder to find in the records sometimes just listed in, as the, on their husband's documents, and after 1903 frequently denied permission, permanent ad admittance despite their marital or maternal status. They're only occasionally visible in the records. Yet they were wives and mothers who were raising families, supporting working husbands, even running businesses, and participating in religious, social, and business organisations. It was not until 1966 that the Australian government allowed the wives and children of Chinese Australian men to settle here permanently, ending decades of discrimination. This is a photo of um, the Queen Vic Market from the museum's collections as well. Uh, Sydney Louis Gung worked as a cabinet maker and fruit agent for Harry Louis Pang and Co, his brother's fruit produce and import export company. Despite the Commonwealth Im Immigration Restriction Act, it's, that's the white Australia policy by the way, um, exemption arrangements could enable the company to ex employ Chinese-born staff as well as Australia-born male workers, which is pretty interesting. In 1938, Sydney was employed by Geraldton Fruit Company at Melbourne's Victoria Market. He worked there into the 1950s. His three sons, Victor, Samuel and Melbourne, were also employed there. Sydney also owned a milk bar in Carlton. Chinese women in Victoria raised their children, undertook domestic duties, and some even owned and managed, managed business in Melbourne's Chinese Quarter. Market gardens and import businesses enabled the home preparation of more traditional Chinese food and beverages. Women also participated in religious and social associations, such as the Young Chinese League. Sydney and May's son Samuel was born in Carlton in 1920, but completed his education in China. After World War II, having served with US forces, Samuel married Mark Wei Kui and had two children, Ling Po and Wing Young. In 1947, the family came to Melbourne and had four more children. They were befriended by Arthur Corwell, federal member for Melbourne, who advised them on how to apply for Australian citizenship, finally achieved by Mary in 1962. <coughs> The Gung, these are some of the items that are on display um, from the Gung family collection. And the collection provides an invaluable representation of Chinese migration and settlement experiences in the museum's migration collections. The family narrative spans two generations, enabling the exploration of key themes, such as the establishment of gradual dilution of the white Australia policy, Chinese businesses in the labour market, and family life. Many of the documents in the collection reflect the gradual easing of the restrictions on Asian migration, which occurred in the 1950s and the 1960s, and policy shifts with, which contributed to the Racial Discrimination Act of 1975. The objects complement the photographs and documents and tell the story of a family's desire to continue their cultural practices and remember their cultural heritage while living in Australia from the 1920s to the 1960s. Our next story is about Nikhil Mundabi Nagadwa. I should have apologised at the start for any pronunciations throughout this whole thing, but um, he's, uh, it's called Carving Out a New Life. Uh, Nikhil cannot return to the country of his birth. In 2000, his father was arrested and taken away when the political regime in the Democratic Republic of Congo changed. 
He still doesn't know what happened to his father. Nikel and his nephew Gwilian left Kinshasa, the Congolese capital of Kinsani, where his pregnant wife Gertrude was staying with his family. Ten days after she gave birth to their first son, rebels came to the family home and brutalised everyone. Gertrude fled with Nikel's sister on foot to Cameroon. The rebels captured Nikel and Gwilian, but they escaped. After almost five months, they reached Douala, Cameroon. After th <laughs> it's Nikel's son, how cute is that? <laughs> After three years separation, the United Nations High Commi Commissioner for Refugees informed Nikel that his wife was alive and searching for him. They re reunited in 2004 at the border of Comoro Cameroon at the DRC. Gertrude uncertain that it would really be him. They had two more children, but their two eldest, one from Nikel's previous marriage, was still missing. In 2009, the family's refugee applications were approved and they were settled in Shepparton in regional Victoria. Gullion remains missing. Nikel paints and carves and continues to attend English classes. He hopes to make a living as a professional artist. Their sons, Gaspi and Exarse, were found in 2001 and are trying to join their family in Shepparton. Gwilion remains missing. Life is not easy. English is a hard language to learn and the unemployment, and unemployment is high in Shepparton, especially amongst recent refugees. But the family became Australian citizens in 2014. That's Christian, he's so cute. <laughs> Sachizi Mundabi Nagawa had always hoped his grandson Nikel would become an artist. Nikel remembers being in his grandfather's workshop when he was five years old and learning to carve small items such as key rings. According to Nikel, Jachizi was the first artist in the Demo Democratic Republic of Congo to professionalise traditional art making practices. Nikel had a prolific teaching and artistic career in Kinshasa, including an apprenticeship at the African Arts Workshop under the master sculptor and painter Oscar Mapani Akombo. All, all that ended abruptly when he was forced to flee Cameroon because of the change in the regime and the arrest of his father. While living in Douala, Nikel made an independent living from his artwork. In 2006, the government of Cameroon helped him establish a painting and sculpting workshop to train underprivileged young people, which is what that photo is of on the right. Nikel arrived in Australia as a refugee in 2009, but trying to be an artist in a new country has many challenges. Nikel asks, or says, someone just arrived who's got nothing and doesn't speak English, where will he go? Where will he buy wood? Where will he buy equipment? He has since established, so he has since exhibited his sculpture and paintings in a number of exhibitions. His sculpture reflects both his traditional culture and artistic influences of his grandfather, as well as more contemporary and abstract form. He also produces items for sale to help support his family. From his art student days until today, Nikel's art practice continues to adapt and evolve. This elephant mask was the first piece he created in Australia. It shows power, it shows spirit, it shows grandeur. This is another of Nikel's artworks called Mask. It's a painting on display at the museum using sand, acrylic paint and sand. It's really beautiful. And another one here called Fam A Family, which is probably my favorite. It's really gorgeous. Um, a quote from Nikel is, art, the tradition is in my blood, and to move to another state, move on to other stages means not to throw away tradition, but to improve it. We've also got on display some of Nikel's sketchbooks where you can see sort of the early musings of these artworks that are, that are on display as well. But they're really beautiful in their own right. Um, this is one of the, the first things that he made in Australia as well. Australians wanted to see African artists carving Australian animals out of Australian wood. They were interested in my art piece, pieces and quick to buy them. This is a kangaroo, it's really cool. Um, Nikel adapted to new timbers to create symbols of both his old and new homelands. He must also be resourceful in finding materials. For example, he made this um, zebra out of discarded wood. They're quite small, they're little mini zebras. They're cool too. Nikel brought many carvings to Australia which demonstrate his Congolese artistic traditions, but maintaining his craft and livelihood with limited resources is difficult, while also establishing his reputation as a professional artist. 
Nikel displaying his carved rings at Shepparton Cultural Festival in 2010. This is their great little key rings. About 160 Congolese people living of diverse ethnic and linguistic backgrounds have settled in Shepparton. Language is spoken including French, Swahili, and the Mundabi family's own language, Lingala. I've also got a video um, with a, a short interview with Mikel, hopefully this way. I'm living here. My name is Nickel Mundabi Ngazwa Nickel. My home country is the Democratic Republic of Congo. There was a trouble there. I went to refugee. It was the 2000. And uh, this is my home. And until now, I continue just to do my art. Art here is very difficult because they can't come with all the uh, uh, tools because I, I was a refugee. I'm doing painting and the carving wood too. My working is a little bit traditional, like in my tradition in Africa, we doesn't have machine. My first teacher in carving wood is my grandfather. In my own village, yeah. I started art with the age of five years. And, uh, to helping my grandfather. Here in Australia, I like a young pine. My friend gave me a young pine. That was a very nice wood. And uh, red gum too. Red gum is very nice to cut, but hard. Yeah. <laughs> this is a, a first step for a small mask. A step to him just form. Now I can design them, <coughs> design to give a good form. This is a nose, here will be eyes. With a traditional model, tra tra traditional artists will not see the shape, but when you uh, when I went to school, I know to give a good shape in your piece. That's, that's true. This piece of wood will take a value after doing this I'm doing now. Because everything, when you do put something inside, it becomes value, it becomes spirit. I'm not talking about a spirit like a vampire or that. no. I'm talking about a something value. And uh, the, this piece of wood will take a value after doing this I'm doing now. He really is a cool dude. It's great to get to know him when they were doing that installation. So the next story is about John Cotton, who we've called Victoria's first ornithologist. Early immigrants to Victoria included highly skilled scientists and specialists, and John Cotton was one such man. Born in London in 1801, Cotton studied law at Oxford University before going to work for a legal firm but his interests lay elsewhere. He was passionate about birds. By the age of 33, he had published the resident song Birds of Great Britain, which is what, oh no, sorry, that's his journal, excuse me. In 1843, Cotton sailed for Port Phillip with his wife Susanna and their four sons, five daughters, and several female servants. He documented the voyage in the Book of Poems, Journal of a Voyage in the Bark, Parkfield, in the year 1843, which is this. This is the one, one of the first pieces of Australian verse to ever be published. Cotton and his family landed in Melbourne. Before long, they were on the move again, traveling to the Goulburn, Goulburn River, where Cotton leased the first of several stations, Dolgaluk. By 1846, six, 
he held more than 155 kilometres squared and expected to run 10,000 sheep. Yet it was birds which remained his passion and he keenly observed his new environment. He began work on a book on the birds of Victoria illustrated with coloured plate, plates from his own drawings. Tragically, he would never see the book published. He died on the 15th of December in 1849, age 47, leaving his wife and 10 children. Susanna, his wife, died only three years later. Life in the Goldburn River, there's a quote here from John Cotton from a letter to his sister-in-law saying, I've purchased a station which has the reputation of being one of the best on the Goldburn. It, has, it is a sheep and cattle station. I have six miles of river frontage with an extensive rich flat and wooded ranges all round. Conditions at Dugaluk, excuse me, were challenging, particularly since workers were in short supply. Cotton and his assistants worked throughout the day on his properties, which by 1846 carried thousands of sheep. His wife Susanna and their daughters had to do most of the domestic work, a new experience for many upper class women. And must amidst this, Susanna gave birth to her 10th child. Um, the relations with Indigenous people, with um, the early settlers in Australia, has always been a bit um, contentious. Um, he, John Cotton's land sat on the edge of a floodplain where Aboriginal people gathered and lived. It was Tarangurung country, and the European settlement meant that they were displaced from their lands. Aboriginal people continued to live in the fringes of the area, frequenting radio, radio ration stations, trading with the settlers and also working for them. Cotton seems to have been on good terms with the local people and recorded cultural practices such as corroborees with general interest. Typical of his time, he firmly believed that those who had cultivated the land, that is, squatters like him, had the right to ownership and therefore could dispossess the original inhabitants. He did describe a corroboree as a strange site, interesting in the highest degree. The environment into which early settlers came was rich and diverse. Most species were unknown to science. John Cotton documented 158 species during his time in Victoria. Many no longer exist where he saw them. The specimen, we have specimens on display in the museum which match the specimens that he drew around the time, including yellow-tailed black cockatoo, eastern yellow robin, yellow-faced honey eater, crimson rosella, crested shrike tit, rainbow lorikeet, and this sacred kingfisher, which is really beautiful. It's some really great taxidermy work um, from the museum collection. John Cotton's dream of publishing a book of birds of the Port Phillip district of New South Wales was finally realized 125 years after his death. His work was passed down through generations of his family until his great granddaughter, Lady May Casey, was instrumental in its publication. His book was finally published in 1974 as John Cotton's Birds of the Fort Phillip Port Phillip District of New South Wales, 1843 to 1849. Here's some of the drawings that are included in there. Cotton's illustrations provide an excellent depiction of the common birds of southeastern Australia. John Cotton used pencil, pen, and watercolours to illustrate birds. Most of his drawings were prel preliminary sketches, not finished works. His colouring was generally, generally accurate, although his quality was inconsistent. Only a few of his belongings are known to survive, so we've um, collected paint box and drawing instruments from the mid 19th century as a bit of a, um, an example of what he may have used back then, which are just beautiful objects. As was typical of the time, John Cotton was an enthusiastic correspondent who sent many letters home to his family in England. They provide a rich insight into the life of early colonial Victoria. He also recorded extensive descriptions of bird life, including quick pen sketches of his observations. John Cotton was a keen observer of his environment, including the people around him. These playing cards illustrate his skill as a cartoonist and his sense of humour. It's actually a cool set of cards they're on display too. And the final story I'll share with you is about Edda Rosola, and we have her beautiful knitting machine in the museum's collection as well. Edda Azola and her husband Angelo arrived in Melbourne in 1955 from Ponteba, a small mountain town in northern Italy. They had migrated to Australia seeking sunshine and adventure, as well as jobs and stability. Edda bought a knitting machine from another Italian migrant woman who set up a workspace in her home to produce knitwear for the Melbourne label Riccardo Knitwear. She has learned her trade 
She had learned her trade back in Italy, where she and her sisters had produced machine-knitted clothing as a cottage industry. Edda was one of the thousands of migrant women who earned a living in Melbourne's garment industry, either in factories or as outworkers in their own homes. The glamour of fashion world was built on the labour of women from Italy, Greece, the former Yugoslavia, and many other countries. Come on, Angelo, we'll go and see the world. It's a cute quote from Edda. The town of Ponteba in the mountains of northern Italy had always been too small for Edda. Even as a child, she had wanted to travel. When her husband's friends sent generous amounts of money home from Australia, Edda decided this was the place for them. Despite the objections of her family, she and Angelo prepared to sail to Melbourne. Angelo left on the line at Australia in early 1955, but due to delays with her visa, Edda travelled later in the year on the Castel Felice. When Angelo meet, met her at Station Pier on the 29th of December 1955, he told the taxi to drive up Burke Street on the way home. Reunited with her husband, surrounded by glowing Christmas lights and starting a new life on the other side of the world, Edda decided that she had found the adventure she'd been looking for her whole life. In the following years, Angelo was a boil maker, boiler maker and Edda worked for Riccardo Nickwear. Together they built a home, raised a son, were active in, Italian, in an active Italian migrant community. They believed that Australia gave them freedom and opportunities they could not find in Italy, and they were happy. There's a great vintage photo of them in Melbourne by the Yarra. Post-war migration coincided with the resurgence of manufacturing and new interest in Australian-made fashion. Melbourne was at the centre of the fashion industry, and Flinders Lane, just a few blocks east of the Immigration Museum, was the heart of it. Hundreds of factories, large and small, were also located in inner city subjects, su suburbs like Fitzroy, Collingwood, Abbotsford and Preston. Migrant women, many of them married with young children, made up the bulk of the workforce. Most of them worked in unskilled, low-paid positions, but their wages kept their fa families afloat financially. Working conditions in many factories were hot, noisy, dirty and even dangerous. Migrant women workers received little consideration from management or help from unions, even though most of them were union members. At the same time, many migrant women found that factory life opened the door to learning English, making new friends and finding independence outside the home. Protective tariffs on clothing were cut in the 1970s, paving the way for cheap imports. Most of the local fashion industry moved, moved, offshore, moved to offshore production and many factories closed. Today, the coffee machine has replaced the sewing machine and old factories are converted to cafes, apartments, galleries and restaurants. This Swiss-made Dubai knitting machine was the international industry standard for much of the 20th century. It's really beautiful. Edda bought this machine in Melbourne in 1958 from an Italian woman who had bought, brought it to Australia. With it, she was able to use the fine knitting skills she had learnt in Italy and earn a living while looking after her family. Angelo modified the machine by removing a flexible arm on the carriage after their young son was nearly injured while playing under it. He also raised it on wooden blocks to reduce the strain on Edda's back. Edda started working in the knitwear industry just as people began to embrace the exuberance of the 1960s fashion, especially Australian design. She spent a professional knitting career working for Richard Chalutsky. Richard, a Polish refugee, arrived in Melbourne in 1950 with no English, but years of experience in the knitwear industry in Paris. By 1958, Mr. Richard had established Ricardo Knitwear, specialising in expensive, high fashion knitwear and Australian merino wool for men and women. As well as employing Edda and a few other independent workers, he had a small factory in Johnson Street, Fitzroy. Some cool vintage ads for Ricardo Knitwear. Edda worked with Richard and his designer to determine how the garments would be constructed. Edda then produced the individual pieces on her machine and other workers assembled them into garments. They were sold in Meyer and David Jones department stores as well as top end boutiques and exclusive George's department store. For 20 years, Ricardo's knitwear collections won prizes in the Australian Wool Fashion Awards, sponsored by Australian Wool Board. By 1978, rising costs and the flood of cheap imported clothing made the production of such labour-intensive garments unviable, and Ricardo Knitwear closed. This is a um, pair of woolen bathers, his and hers, <laughs> that Edda made in Italy <laughs> to bring to Australia, the sunny country. They're so cool. They're on um, display at the museum too. 
Etta was one of the elite textile workers in Melbourne. Respected and valued by her employer, she earned more money than factory women and had greater independence and did not have the constant worry and expense of childcare. But as an outworker, she always also long, worked long hours, juggled the competing demands of her job and her family and had no benefits or protections. Cheap imports in the 1970s priced Edda's work out of the market and she ceased working professionally in 1978. But more than 30,000 women, many from new migrant communities, are still outworkers in Australia's garment industry, most of them outside the protection of government regulation or union action. I work in the Immigration Discovery Centre at the um, Immigration Museum in Melbourne. And these exhibitions are created by a team of museum experts, including curators, producers, exhibition managers, collection and conservation staff, designers and builders. But the exhibitions of the Immigration Museum would be nothing without the personal accounts and amazing histories of Australia's population. The Immigration Discovery Centre is on the ground floor of the museum and can offer assistance to researchers looking for their families' migration stories. We have access to records, books and online resources and our staff are waiting to assist visitors put, to help put together the puzzle of their family's immigration history. Thank you.